Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I'll be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick. We have all been waiting to get back to Europe, and Europe has been waiting for us. In tonight's show, Rick will share some of, his, some of the places he misses the most. And now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Rick Steves, who will be our tour guide this evening. Hi, Rick. Hey, Julianne, thanks for inviting everybody in because we're going to have a little party here. And uh, I got a, I got some Prosecco. You don't see me uh, pouring bubbly very often because I just love red wine. But uh, this is an exciting week for us. Um, tonight, as I think you guys know, um, we have a show that is Common Carriage. It's the first time in my 30-year career on public television where we've had a new show air all over the country at the same time in almost every city, seven o'clock or eight o'clock tonight, they're running a show called Europe Awaits. Talk about timely. So we're celebrating that Europe Awaits and we thought we'd make this uh, Monday night uh, travel event kind of a tailgate party for the airing of that show. So I hope you can coordinate your Monday night travel and your local public television stations airing of our new show, Europe Awaits. It's a two hour special and it's popping all over Europe, dropping in on places that are good for our travel and soul, good for our wanderlust as we come out of this pandemic. We're not there yet. We've still got a little ways to go. But another reason I'm enjoying a nice spritz here is because we just opened up our tour sales uh, for the first time in 14 or 16 months or something like that in one week. Come here, a little closer. We sold 20,000 seats. I mean, I'm not normally that giddy about tour sales, but we have never done anything like this. Last year, we had to cancel 24,000 seats and send back deposits for all those people who are dreaming of traveling with us. We've patiently waited. We decided it's safe, it's reliable, it's predictable for next year. Not yet for 2021, but for early 2022, we opened up the floodgates Thank you for those of you who have rushed in because we've got a thousand tours now in 2022 that are almost full. I'll tell you a little more about that later, but right now we got to get going on our travels. Mm. And I'm well into this Aperol spritz. You just call it a spritz, but it is three parts bubbly and in, it's an Italian drink. So from the Northwest of Italy, they have Prosecco. It's a lot, it's essentially champagne but you can't call it champagne. It's Prosecco, Cava, sparkling wine, whatever. Three parts Prosecco, two parts Aperol. And this is a, it's a aperitivo. It's sort of to stoke your appetite. And uh, I'm gonna stoke my appetite for travel right now. Then you have a splash of soda water and there you go. I love this because when I drink it, I think of being in a piazza in Italy, in a university town where all the kids are out having a good time as the sun goes down and they're just uh, enjoying a little happy hour. Everybody's got the setting sun shining through their Aperol spritz. And with the sun shining through this orange drink, everybody is just rosy and happy. And it is a great opportunity for a traveler to get to know the locals. Go to the piazza where the students are, buy everybody a round of Aperol spritz, and you're the most popular kid on the block. Mm. So we'll be talking about our spritz. We're gonna be eating, of course, Italian style. Our salad is the cup Pre salad, insalata caprese. And it's named for the Isla Capri. And there you go. You see the Italian flag right there red, white, and green. Green is basil, white is cheese, generally mozzarella. But I took a little liberty here and I crumpled up some feta cheese just because I really like feta. And you've got your tomatoes. An Italian probably wouldn't recognize the taste of these tomatoes because in Campania, the area around the island of Capri in Naples, the tomatoes. And I remember this even when I was a teenager, I bit into a tomato around Naples. It is so tasty. So you gotta have your insalata caprese, your caprese, your caprese salad when you're in that area. In fact, you can have it anywhere in Italy. And then today we're doing our bruschetta. And I made four here. And I made one that's just your classic toast with extra virgin olive oil. It's rubbed with a raw clove of garlic, or I guess you could say a yeah, clove of raw garlic, and then sprinkled with some sea salt. I've also got, uh, this is one I just innovated myself. It's a uh, steak with uh, caramelized onions and mushrooms sauteed with some olive oil. And this one is, all of them have the 
uh, garlic clove and the olive oil in the sea salt. And then we've got here some mozzarella, some basil and some chopped up tomatoes. And I love this one. This has the Cinque Terre written all over it. This is anchovies, this is grilled peppers, and this is pesto sauce. And in the Cinque Terre, Liguria, the northern coast of Italy, they have a lot of great anchovies and it's the birthplace of pesto. So these are my four show and tell bruschetta and I will be eating them as we travel. I wanna thank you for joining us. I love Mondays. This is 32 in a row now we've done. Every Monday we get together. It's our chance to enthuse about travel until we can travel again. And I'm so thankful you're here. Every Monday we gather, it's just, I'm like, you know, I just get the house all ready because I feel like I've got a couple thousand people dropping by for a little travel dreaming and a little dinner and maybe a spritz like tonight. Mm. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what we're going to do here. Let me just go to our website. And uh, when you go to our website, um, this is ricksteves.com. And the big news, I, as I mentioned, is our tours. You got everything right here on the landing page. Um, I'll take you to the tours first because um, we've got a special little blue box of information here because we've just been, as you can imagine, overwhelmed. It's all hands on deck as 20, over 20,000 people have signed up for tours this week. We made a special thing. If you just click on seats available, you can see, because it's frustrating otherwise, you can see which tours still have a lot of seats available. So as I said, there's 40 itineraries, over a thousand departures. Here we got Italy in nine days. You can click there. And this is the heart of Italy. Oh, I love this one here. And here you got plenty of seats, sign up, sign up, sign up, sign up. So we got lots of seats available uh, on this particular tour and a few of them are sold out. But if you wanna learn more about that, you know where to find it. Now, what I wanna do though, is go into the bottom corner as I do every week into Classroom Europe. And we've got here 500 little clips distilled out of over hundred TV shows. This is our program we've made as a gift to teachers and homeschooling parents. And you can go here and cobble together whatever you like according to theme or keyword or country or festival or whatever, and you can make your own little show. Everybody, it's free, there's no ads. You can just uh, use it in your teaching or your travel dreaming. We've all got our own private little archive of playlists. And I produced this one here for tonight's uh, entertainment, Europe Awaits. And if we look at that one, it is six videos and you can see it all right here. It's about 30 minutes and that's where we're gonna go right now. So we're gonna start off on a cruise ship and we're gonna start off on a cruise ship uh, thinking about traveling post COVID. A nice thing about a cruise ship is you move into one hotel and then you go every day to a different, different port. And um, you know, when everybody's got their shots, you won't get into Europe, I don't think, unless you got your shots. And I think the cruise ships have put a very high priority on safety and hygiene. And if we've all got our shots, it is a, a reasonable way and an economic way to travel, certainly efficient. And this is a look at Santorini. In our TV special tonight, we've, we're going to Mykonos. I thought I would compliment it by going with you in this Monday night travel episode to Santorini. And uh, we shot this in one day. It was really fun with our TV crew because we were limited to our cruise schedule. We were on that first tender on shore, shot like crazy. We we're the last people back on board. I do wanna remind you as you start out right here, when the pilot or the captain says, get up early and watch the approach to the harbor, it's worth getting up. So let's go to Santorini right now. And uh, we're gonna be up on the deck. We're gonna be up on the deck while everybody else is still sleeping because we are well-organized travelers going for Baroque to get the maximum experience. And we are in the Aegean Sea. The Aegean Sea offers the quintessence of Mediterranean island charm. Punctuated by romantic nights at sea, our itinerary promises plenty of unforgettable sightseeing. In the morning, we'll be in Santorini. I enjoy the scenic arrivals and departures by cruise ship. Being on the top deck as you approach the day's destination gives you a quiet, bird's eye view. Approaching an exotic and fabled island like Santorini as the moon sets and the sun rises, just kissing the lip of the breathtaking cliffs is worth getting up for. Santorini is a dramatic island, the rim of a volcanic crater with spectacular vistas. Once a complete island like its neighbors, it was a volcano that, about 3,500 years ago, blew its top, creating a caldera, this flooded crater. Today, 
Inviting whitewashed villages seem to crowd its dramatic ridges, as if jostling to enjoy the views. Because Santorini's pier is small, giant cruise ships drop anchor and tender their passengers in on small shuttle boats. Individuals go to the tiny Old Harbor, where they can ride a donkey up the zigzag trail, or hop a cable car to the scenic lip of the island crater. Those paying for the cruise line's excursion get off the ship first and head for an alternative port, where buses and guides await. With the crush of the crowds, the limited time, and the scattered array of interesting sights, investing in a bus tour like this to see Santorini can make sense. Within minutes, you'll be powering up the switchbacks into the island as your guide narrates the drive. Those two are the Kameni Islands. The Kameni Islands are actually made of lava rock. Excursions also include scenic views from the bus and the stress-free efficiency of getting smoothly from point to point. And tour groups are sure to have free time at the best photo ops. Ia is the postcard image of the Greek Isles. So I want to talk just for a minute about cruises here because, you know, it's good and bad. It's certainly not my favorite style of traveling, but for a lot of people, it's in their comfort zone, it's economic, and it's efficient. You get one day in each port and you travel at night. But you got to kind of take the whole package deal. One problem with cruising is you're always there with the crowds. And when the, when the ship sails away, suddenly the island's relaxed and not crowded, but you're on the ship. You are the crowd and ships have 3,000 people. So your challenge is to, when you arrive, get away from those crowds if you can. On the other hand, the organized bus tour, the excursion from the cruise can be an advantage. In the case of Santorini, those who take the bus tour get to the island before everybody else and they arrive and they've got a bus waiting for them. And I kind of like to be get the best of both worlds. In the case of Santorini, I thought it was worth taking the uh, organized excursion because bam, 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 you see all the famous things with a guide. But then I cut out before the tour is over often. In this case, I even cut out and had uh, the last half of my day in Santorini with a local guide. You've always got local guides trying to earn a living out of kind of bottom feeding along with all the cruise business. They want to, they're standing by ready to, to snap up any business. And if there's two couples, you can hire a private guide for about the same cost as your organized bus excursion. Um, so you're going to meet right now this local guide and he was great and he had his own car and that made a lot of sense also. This idyllic ensemble of whitewashed houses and characteristic domes is delicately draped over a steep slope at the top of a cliff. Viewpoints here are some of the most striking in the Greek seas as tourists clamor for just the right angle. Artists fall in love with Ia and move in. Honeymooners find the B&B &B of their dreams. And here's a, here's a situation. These, these are the kind of lucky travelers, the elite travelers, the not on the cruise travelers. They're staying here, sitting there, having a lazy brunch, watching all the cruise people in their packs of travelers with their selfies and so on. And for the hours that the cruise ship is in, the island is a mob scene. When the cruise ship sails away, these guys have the island all to themselves. Anybody can do that. Savor breakfast in unforgettable settings. And at the quiet end of town, the old windmill reminds all of a more rustic age gone by. The whitewash, while scenic today, was originally practical. White reflects the powerful heat of the sun. The lime that makes the whitewash is a good antiseptic. Villagers knew it would naturally disinfect the rainwater that was collected on rooftops. And I love the way the blue and white of the townscape seems inspired by the colors of the Greek flag. Many of these dwellings originated as humble caves. With little building material on the island, it just made sense to dig into the cliffs. These cave houses, surrounded by air-filled pumice, are naturally insulated, staying cool in summer and warm in winter. Gradually, these cheapest bits of real estate were developed, and with tourism, they became today's expensive villas, hotels, and restaurants. With each port, you've got sightseeing options. You can take the organized bus tour and be on their timetable, or you can hire a private guide. 
You can use a guidebook and be your own guide, or you can just hang out and be thoroughly on vacation. There's no right or wrong. It depends on your mood and your style. I've left our bus tour early for a rendezvous with a private local guide. Uh, we had a big earthquake back in 1956, 7.8 Richter scale, destroyed very many houses, like this captain's house over here. And on the other side, you can see that Venetian fortress, it's destroyed. It's been there since the 14th century. To get the absolute most out of our Santorini day, I've booked half a day with Demetris. While pricey, if two couples split the cost, enjoying the services of a private guide can cost about the same as the cruise line's bus tour. So remember that. I want to make that point very clear. A cruise is a pretty inexpensive way to travel, but you spend a lot of money with all the excursions and they count on you to do that. And that's how they can make their decent profit. But there's nothing wrong with taking the cruise and not taking the excursions and lining up your own guides in each port. They wait for the cruise ship. There's hundreds of people that do it, it seems, with every ship. They got your name on a piece of paper and you just emailed them in advance, you've booked them, you've paid for it in advance, and they're ready to give you a wonderful day. For the cost of two couples taking the organized bus tour, you can have your own guide with a car like I've got here. Of Santorini's many beaches, Camari is one of the best. The black sand is a reminder of the island's volcanic origin. Typical of Greek island resort beaches, it's lined with rentable lounge chairs and a strip of seafood restaurants. And with Demetris, I know exactly what I'm eating. These salads look delicious. Can you tell me about them? Well, we have a Greek salad and a Santorini salad. The difference with a local salad is that we use the local tomatoes, the cherry tomatoes, the local cucumbers, and instead of the feta cheese, we use the goat cheese, and we add the capers and the caper leaves. See, you can eat them. They taste good. Right, we've got uh, some sardines here, grilled, mm -hmm. and on the other side, we've got uh, a very nice grilled calamari, also served with salad, the lemon, and the olive oil. Yes. This is a healthy diet. This is the Mediterranean diet. Okay, so now, we have done our little Greek time. And I got to say, after COVID, hanging out on a Greek aisle sounds kind of nice. I doubt if I would, I think I would do with more time. I'd, I'd like to post COVID travel with a little more time than the zip, 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 one day at a port uh, tempo dictated by a cruise ship. But so much sun, so many big flavors. Uh, it's just a beautiful opportunity to get into Greek culture on those islands. Now we're going to have kind of an abrupt change. We're going to go to Sicily. And you wouldn't really want to do Sicily by cruise ship. My cruise ship stopped at a port called Messina, and it really had no appeal to me. You can fly into Sicily quite easily. There's a good airport in Catania. Uh, near Syracuse and Mount Etna and Taormina, and there's a good airport near Palermo. And when you fly into Sicily, remember, you're going to be experienced kind of Italy in the extreme. What I was saying, and I will be saying in the show tonight that's airing, I mentioned the Europe Await show is, if you like Italy, go further south because it, get, it gets better. If Italy is getting on your nerves by the time you get down to Rome, don't go further south because it gets more intense. And that may be more than what you're bargaining for. But if you like Italy, I think you'll love Sicily. And a great thing about Sicily is it's what they call a, a sort of a lasagna of cultures. You know, a dozen different civilizations came and went, conquered and were conquered, leaving their traditions, their heritage, their, their, their cuisine and so on. And you enjoy it when you're in, in Sicily. So let's hop over now from Greece to Sicily and see what I'm talking about. Sicily is small, about the size of Vermont and the Autostrada makes it smaller yet. In just three hours, we're clear across the island and heading toward the highest point in Sicily. At about 11,000 feet, Mount Etna, Europe's biggest volcano, towers majestically above the villages and farmland of the east coast. Ascending dramatic switchbacks, we pass a buried house, an eerie reminder of recent lava flows. While there's a serious eruption every few years, we should be okay today. There are different ways to experience the mountain, and we're taking the easy route. A gondola sweeps us over an otherworldly land of lava. At the top of the lift, we board an all-terrain shuttle. Climbing higher yet up the rugged track, visitors marvel as views get ever more dramatic. Finally, at the end of the road, 
we hike to the lip of a vast crater. Hiking the circular rim leaves us with unforgettable memories. Today, the mountain's quiet, but small plumes of smoke and steam remind us that this peaceful perch can change in a hurry. So I've been in Sicily several times, actually, when there's been some kind of an eruption and the whole island is dusted in, in black um, volcanic dust. And uh, it, it's, it's a kind of a strange uh, sensation, but it's part of the whole life of Sicily. And over time, that lava has contributed to the soil and it's part of the terroir. And in a moment, we're gonna go to a vineyard, a wonderful family run vineyard with great wine, right literally on the slopes of this volcano. And part of the deliciousness of their wine is due to this volcanic ash. Geologically speaking, Sicily is part Europe and part Africa. It's where two tectonic plates, the Eurasian plate and the African plate, are slowly colliding. That's why there's lots of tremors and volcanic activity. Today, the slopes of Etna are renowned for their fertile soil and some of the finest vineyards in Sicily. We're visiting the Benanti family estate, getting to know the father and his twin sons for a taste of this dimension of the island. Did you notice how well I just said piacere there, huh? I'm just like I speak Italian. <laughs> I know a spritz, that's for sure. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm a horrible example of an American monoglot. I speak only English, nothing to brag about, but we speak the language that works and we can get away with it. But it's rude not to know some basic words when you're in a country. I honestly cannot put a sentence together properly. I don't know any grammatical, whatever you call that stuff, grammar or a punctual, all that kind of, I just know a few key words. Piacere, nice to meet you. I like to say complimenti, nice work, my compliments. I like to say bon lavoro. I'm always dealing with people who are working and I just say best wishes in your work. Bon lavoro or good work. Man, that was great. I'm a polite guy when I'm traveling. I like to say after you, dopo di lei. It's just fun words to know. If I'm going into a shop and I want to look around, they're kind of going, what's up with you? And you go, buongiorno, uh, posso guardare? And that means, hello, good day. Mind if I look around a little bit? Posso guardare. If you learn that, all of a sudden, you, you break the ice, you're okay, you're comfortable. If you find something really, really beautiful, you can say, indimenticabile. That means unforgettable. What a fun word to know how to say. And when things wanted to go not so fast, relax, mellow out, I like to say piano, 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 piano. That's what they say in Italy. So these are just words that fit Italy and learn your words in every country. And it is just polite and it gets you a little more smiling, a few more smiles. We're in the slopes of Mount Etna, Europe's most active volcano and actually a great wine region. What we have here is volcanic soil. The soil comes from lava. Eruptions from thousands of years ago have now become sand mixed with rocks, and they provide minerality to our wines. The soil gives the minerality, the altitude keeps the vines fresh. Therefore, wines from Etna are highly distinctive, and they're known for their elegance and finesse. Etna, just like the rest of Sicily, has been producing grapes for thousands of years, but only in the last three decades has the quality of Etna wine achieved such great notoriety and prestige. Now, Salvino's family has this incredible ancient wine press or grape press, just giant oak beams and so on. And it's just, it's just, it's just rich with history and family heritage and good wine. I wanted to show it off and I wanted Salvino to show it off, but he needed to get it tight if we're gonna make it into the show. So one of my favorite things to do is to work with my friends in Italy or anywhere we're uh, making a TV show. And we walk through it and we understand how it's got to be tight, not too many words, no tangents, and it's got to have a rhythm. As you look at this and that, you tell the story and the cameraman just knows where you're going to be. So here's a great example, I think, of a very smart local guy that knew how to help us teach the way we wanted to teach in our show. Wine has been made here for 200 years. The grapes will be gathered up there on the top level and be crushed by the workers' feet they would then be crushed a second time in the central vat using this very heavy chestnut tree trunk as a press, uh -huh. aided by this very heavy stone 
and the bar, which would be turned heavily to press the grapes. The juice would then flow in here, ferment, and after one year, you would have wine. But this time, you don't have to wait that long. All right. Thank you. Ha, now we're going to step into the tasting room. And this is something that is really quality about Europe. And it's something I'm looking forward to post-COVID. Connecting with the little family um, ventures, the entrepreneurs, the, 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 the labors of love. And this family has been, been making wine here generation to generation for a long, long time. We met the father, we meet the twin sons. We, we, they, they grip the wine and with the family name on the label. It's just, it's a delightful thing. And I'm just hoping post COVID these small businesses will still be there. And I'm determined to go to these small mom and pop places, patronize them and celebrate that they got through COVID. It's gonna be, be a big part of my post COVID travels. And that's something we're gonna focus on with our tours as well. We join our guide Alfio and Salvino's twin brother, Antonio, to taste some of the family's wine. So we all know Italian wine. What about Sicilian wine? It feels like it's the, the new kid on the block. Well, uh, a lot of wine has always been made in Sicily, but again, Sicily was sort of laid back and uh, somewhat poor region. Uh, but in the last couple of decades, new generations are more affluent uh, and more sophisticated, and that is showing in the wines. So as a Sicilian vintner, uh, would you say, uh, look out Tuscany? Yes, you know, uh, the whole world should keep an eye on what is happening in Sicily. Uh, the beauty of wine is diversity and mirroring a culture in a glass. So we are not trying to be like somebody else or like some other regions. We, are, we want to show the full potential of this region. And I think it's starting to show. And Antonio, to that I would say, buon lavoro. Buon lavoro, grazie, buon lavoro. grazie. Ah, buon lavoro, buon lavoro. Did you see how that worked? It was easy. Anybody can do that. I can do it, you can do it. Hey, that was the Bananti family vineyard. Uh, and uh, we always put, our, our team puts the links to the most important visits that we make in Monday Night Travel in the um, chat section. So, or in the Q&A or somewhere in there, you can find that and, and link, click on through and find out more information about these places that we visit. Um, this is a good example, this Benanti Family Vineyard, of places I just love to find because it's an experience. And we're very careful to take our tours there. And man, I, I just signed up on our Sicily tour a couple of years ago. I was blown away by the quality of the food. It's, it's a big hit in Sicily is the food. As a business, when we add these regions in Europe, it's viable only if we have the three legs of our business stool working in sync. We have to make a TV show about it, so everybody knows about it. We have to write a guidebook about it, so we have all the contacts and we know where to go for eating and sleeping. And we have to take tours there so we can make a little money to pay for everything else because the guidebooks and the TV shows really don't make it the money, it is the tours. So in a case like Sicily, we've got two TV shows, we've got a wonderful tour program. Alfio, our guide there is one of our lead guides. He found the Benanti family just in the winter when he was tooling around and now it's part of our tours. And uh, of course we got the, the guidebook. Uh, so it all works together that way. Um, I wanna take just a minute to just celebrate this food that I'm eating. And I've already eaten most of the props. It's important not to eat the props, but I just can't wait. Um, and I wanted to remind you, this is the basic thing. What you get rustic bread and you rub, you just scrape the, the, the raw garlic on it and, uh, and uh, pinch some sea salt. Uh, you always will find mozzarella. You'll always find basil and you'll always find extra virgin olive oil. And the cool thing about bruschetta is if you can, if you like it, you can put it together. I mean, you just toss it on the on the piece of toast and you got it. I, I love steak. I love mushrooms. I love onions. So we're going to call this the uh, Ricardo Delizioso. Okay, that's what we'll call this one. And uh, that's your bruschetta adventure. And uh, a go-to salad for me when I'm in Italy is the uh, salad caprese. And I think it's because the cheese is so tasty. The tomatoes are so tasty. The basil is so tasty and the olive oil is so tasty. And one thing great about Italy, this is, a, this is the epitome of Italian cooking here. It's the ingredients. In France, I love France, I love French cuisine for sure, but it, it generally is not this simple. That's what Italy is all about. The best ingredients that are matched together in what they call a good marriage. We're gonna go now to Portugal. 
And in the TV show that's airing all over the United States right now, we're going up into Porto, the second city in the Douro River Valley. We're going to complement that as we're doing with each one of these stops tonight in Monday Night Travel with a visit to my favorite beach resort in Portugal. It's called Nazaré. And as you'll see in Nazaré, the traditions are alive and very, very well. So right now, let's leave Sicily and go to Portugal. Our first stop, the fishing town of Nazaré. We're here in May and the beach is all ours. While touristy in the summer, Nazaré offers a good look at how bits of traditional Portugal survive. The community faces its sweeping beach. People stroll the promenade. Old timers enjoy the scene. Kids use the beach for a soccer field. And families catch some springtime sun before the hordes of summer vacationers arrive. Nazaré has a strong fishing heritage. While nothing like its heyday, fishermen still manage to harvest the sea. Working as a team as the sun drops, they set their nets with wisdom passed down from their grandfathers. The next morning, the women of the town prepare the day's catch. Splayed and salted fish are put out on nets to dry under the midday sun. This simple way of preserving fish carries on, unchanged for generations. Locals claim they're delicious, but I'd rather eat another salty treat, barnacles. Okay. So this is a barnacle. Yeah. How do you say that in Portuguese? Percebes. Percebes. Can you show me the trick to opening it? Yeah. You. Ah. <laughs> mm, it's good. Yeah. So where do these come from? From the rocks. From there. Just from right over there, huh? Yeah. Today? Yeah. <laughs> really? It's games today. Someday, so it's fresh. So I break it. Okay. Like so. Look at that. It's beautiful. Mm. How do you say delicious? Muito bom. Muito bom. Percebes? Muito bom. Good. And with beer? Perfect. Bon appetit. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Obrigado. Here's an example. I, I, I really enjoy my backpacker heritage. And uh, when I was a backpacker, I could never afford the barnacles. I'll tell you that. Those barnacles, those percebs are the most expensive thing on the menu. Uh, but they're the best thing on the menu. And once in a while, you really got to go for the top of the menu. And uh, you got to know what in each country is on the top of the menu. And is it worth uh, getting? And where should you get it? You can get it in a market. You can actually buy your barnacles in a market and take them to a cafe and they'll boil them there for you just for a small price. And then you've got the cheapest barnacles possible. But in a funky little hole in the wall like this, glass of beer and a plate of barnacles, that's a beautiful, unforgettable memory. As we go deeper now into this town, Nazare, we will see short people. And I've been always fascinated by different countries that have short people. And uh, I thought it was genetic, but I was just in Guatemala where there's a lot of short people. And it really is a matter of diet. It's a matter of poverty. It's a matter of tough times. It's a matter of wars and dictators and so on. And um, in Guatemala, when you see a short person, it's not because of their genetics, it's because they are stunted. They didn't get enough nutrition during their growing years. If I remember years ago, I think most of the people from the Spanish Civil War have passed away, but there was all sorts of people that were a head shorter than, than younger people. And it was because they lived during Spain's tragic civil war. And in Portugal, you got a lot of older people who are very short. They lived during the difficult times under the dictator Salazar. Uh, the traditions in a town like this are so rich and so vivid. And it's our challenge when we travel there to know what we're looking at, know what to eat, know why the people are wearing what they're wearing and so on. And you can do that if you are properly equipped with good information and you use it, or if you have a good local guide. Nazare's women are known for their traditional skirts with many layers of petticoats to keep them warm, reminiscent of the old days when they'd sit on the beach awaiting the return of their fishermen. And this proud woman is eager to describe her outfit. The short skirts are made bulky by many petticoats. The aprons are embroidered by hand. 
The stockings are high and loud. Flamboyant jewelry is passed down from generation to generation. And when the wind whips up, her shawl keeps her warm. See? See? Put him see? Nice. Obrigado. <laughs> OK. Obrigado. Bon dag. Bon dag. Nazare's Folk Club keeps their traditions lively with music and dance. This troupe's been gathering crowds since the 1930s. I got to mention, uh, sometimes it's complicated when we're making a TV show because the cameraman has certain needs. This band, this troupe of dancers, typically routinely dances in the sand where it's easy on their bare feet. Carl needed them to dance for some reason on the um, mosaic pave pavement here, the, the sidewalk. And there's, it was full of little pebbles and the people were heroically dancing on this. But I didn't learn until afterwards that they were in great pain because they were dancing on top of all these little pebbles. So bless the hearts of all these dancers for our show right now. When you see the percussion section, you'll see it's pine cones going together and then it's some big piece of kelp hitting a, an old amphora. It's such a cool, you know, salt of the earth band here. And when we do something like this for the camera, we only have one camera because we're a little crew with three people, me, the producer and the cameraman. Uh, and we got to ask them to play the same thing three times so Carl can go through and get everything together. So when we come home, our editor, Steve, has everything he needs to put a little clip like this together. Check it out. All right, next we're going to Italy and Hilltowns, and there's the classic Hilltown. I can't imagine a more quintessential Hilltown than Civita di Bagnareggio, and I'm in, back in Italy now, so I'm going to have some more Prosecco, and uh, you got to drink it quick, because if the ice cubes melt, ha, it waters the whole drink down. Three parts Prosecco, two parts, I never did well in chemistry, but I can handle this, two parts Aperol, and just a splash of soda. All right, chin chin. Now, um, <laughs> we're gonna go to Italy now and this little clip is, what is it? It's Hilltowns and Hilltowns. When Rome fell, everybody in the valley realized, hey, it's chaos, every man, every woman for themselves, let's head for the high country. And they went up into the pinnacles and they made little walled fortified towns in order not to be overrun by all the chaos. That's the origin of these hill towns. Today, they are cool. They are breezy. They are time warps. You will find so many beautiful traditions in the hill towns. And if you choose the right hill town, it will not be a tourist trap. If you go to a famous hill town, it's going to be touristy and you got to balance. How do you want to shape your Italian experience? After COVID, I'm going to want the breezy, traditional, cool, less touristed places when I go back to Italy. Connoisseurs of Italy find the quintessential charms of this country in its characteristic hill towns. By the way, I was so excited. We had the good weather. We had just filmed Civita di Bonareggio so beautifully. It was uh, two hours north of Rome here, this little town that we love to take our groups. And then we forgot the sun was going down. We had to run with our gear from the hill town down that donkey path and then up to this little perch. And to my horror, the place I wanted to make the on camera for this opening was in shade. So I'd be dark and the town would be well lit or the town would be really overexposed and I'd be properly lit. And I had to stand on a table here on my tiptoes almost to be able to be in the sun. And we just had a couple of minutes before the sun had set to the point where this would not have been a doable shot. The sun low in the sky is great, but when the sun is gone, You've lost your window. So I was thankful for this one. Built on hilltops for defensive purposes in ancient and medieval times, today their lofty perches seem only to protect them from the modern world. We'll drive through the Tuscan and Umbrian countryside connecting all the hilltown dots. Admire a ceiling fresco masterpiece not by Michelangelo, 
eat rustic bruschetta, mm. visit a vineyard that goes all the way back to Etruscan times, and more. All while exploring a string of hill-capping medieval towns that somehow managed to keep their heads above the flood of the 21st century. So many European travel dreams feature Italy. And in Italy, the regions of Tuscany and Umbria are home to the greatest hill towns, all within easy striking distance of Rome or Florence. In this episode, we visit Civita di Bagnoregio, Orvieto, Cortona, and finally San Gimignano. So I'm always wondering why are the favorite places I discovered so undiscovered? Why are they not as touristy as they should be? Here's an example. Civita di Reggio, Civita di Reggio, that's my favorite hill town. The place tourists go for hill towns is Umbria and Tuscany. Look where Civita is located, just over the state border in the province of, or the region of Lazio. Nobody goes to Lazio to see hill towns. Lazio does not have a tourist board that promotes hill towns. Civita is just sort of falling through the cracks. Orvieto is crowded, Assisi is crowded, Cortona is crowded, Siena, San Gimignano is certainly crowded. Civita, it's in the wrong state. It's less touristy. Hey, we'll take it any way we can. It's a great opportunity. Many of this region's hill towns date back to Etruscan times, well before ancient Rome. Others date to the fall of Rome. When Rome fell, Europe was engulfed in chaos. People naturally grabbed for the high ground to escape the marauding barbarians that characterized those dark ages. Over time, these towns were fortified and eventually functioned as independent city-states. In their glory days, they proudly charted their own course, generally free from the dictates of popes or emperors. Then, the bubonic plague swept through Tuscany in 1348. That, combined with the increasing dominance by the regional bully, Florence, turned many bustling cities into docile backwaters. Ironically, the bad news of the 14th century mothballed these towns, leaving them with a unique charm and a tourism-based affluence today. Siena maintains much of its medieval character. Its sprawling main square and towering city hall recall the days when it rivaled even Florence. Assisi, with its walls, gates, and castle, was home to St. Francis. Its massive basilica remains a favorite destination for countless pilgrims today. Volterra was an Etruscan capital centuries before Christ. Within a... By the way, Volterra, remember that word, Volterra. That's my favorite um, hill town for that sort of the medieval experience. If you look at our Heart of Italy tour, it includes, um, I believe it includes the Cinque Terre for the Riviera, Florence and Rome. And this is for people that want to do the best of Italy, but only have 10 days or something like that. And um, Volterra is the one hill town we stop at. I just love Volterra. Wall, the town's rustic center offers an evocative Tuscan charm. And San Marino, all 24 square miles of it, is unique in that it's still an independent country. While novel today, tiny two-bit dukedoms like this were once the norm. So I want to remind you, that was once the norm. Italy used to be just a whole pile of little independent city-states like San Marino. The, I think the only one that survives to this day is San Marino, landlocked inside of Italy for some quirky reason. But they all got it together, and with the heroics of the founding fathers of Italy in the 1860s, they created a united country, gathering together all the Italian-speaking people who would be ruled under the one Italian-speaking king, Victor Emmanuel from Piedmont. And uh, the famous slogan was, okay, we've created Italy. Now we need to create Italians. And to this day, people have a bigger loyalty to their town, to the sound of their bell tower than they do to Italy as a whole. There's that regionalism. And there's even a word for it, campanilismo, that love of the sound of the bell in their campanile, their bell tower, campanilismo. Maybe we have a little bit of that in our lives also. I love the sound of the bell tower in my town or the church tower. Medieval Italy, like most of Europe before the rise of modern nation states, was a collection of independent little San Marino-style city-states, many of them no more than fortified towns on hills. While each of those hill towns are famous and very touristy, the explorer who gets off the beaten path can still discover hill towns with much less tourism. A good example is Civita di Bagnoregio. Perched on a pinnacle in a grand canyon, 
the traffic-free village of Civita is, for me, Italy's classic hill town. Entering the town, you're enveloped in history. Mm. Passing under a 12th century arch, you enter another world. Every lane tells a story. On the main square, the church marks the spot where first an Etruscan temple, and then later a Roman temple once stood. Important point, holy buildings from one civilization are often built atop the ruins of the civilization they triumphed over. So here you have a, a church that's been there for more than a thousand years. Before that, right on that spot was the Etruscan temple. And you see right there, the pillars, they've been reset up, but those were, that's just the top of the pillars that used to decorate the Etruscan temple that stood there when it was an Etruscan town before Christianity arrived in Europe. Ancient pillars from those pagan temples stand like giant's bar stools in front of the latest place of worship to occupy this spot. For me, exploring a town like Civita is a cultural scavenger hunt. There are countless towns like this throughout Italy with similar subtle charms. A fancy wooden door and windows lead to thin air. This was the facade of a Renaissance palace, which fell into the valley, riding a chunk of the town's ever-eroding rock pinnacle. Pondering the view, you're reminded that slowly but surely, this town will succumb to the march of geological time. Cevita is adapting to the modern world. As its permanent population dwindles, it's becoming a weekend escape for wealthy urbanites. The families that stay are catering to visitors. To enrich your experience, be an extrovert, poke around, talk to people. Come, Rick, I want to show you my meal. The olive mill Maurizio's grandfather once ran is now the centerpiece of his restaurant and he's happy to tell me how Grandpa made the olive oil. All the olive come from the valley. When they have about 200 kilograms of olive, they put here the olive, and uh, with that donkey, they start the press for about two hours, a hard work. When the paste is ready, they put the paste inside this filter, and uh, when you have about 15 or 20 filters full, you are ready for, for the press. And then, when the filter is ready, you can make the first press. You put the stick here, mm. and you make a hard work for about two hours. Right. You press, and you wait. You have a good extra virgin olive oil, and you're ready for a big bruschetta. A good bruschetta is simple. Bread toasted over the coals, garlic, tomatoes, salt, and oil. No, oh, that is so good. I, I got to just run that again because I'm sorry. Look at this. And I want you to know, I make a, a great bruschetta right here in Seattle, Washington, USA. I don't care how good you are or I am. It cannot begin to be as tasty as a bruschetta made in Italy. I don't know why, it's the ingredients, it's the terroir, the heritage, the culture, the tradition, the love, it's good. But you can try, you can try here, but you'll go to Italy and you'll see what I'm talking about. Watch how they make this. Simple. Bread toasted over the coals, garlic, mm. tomatoes, mm -hmm. salt, and oil. And family, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, the kids, the donkeys, the history. I'm a sucker for it. Enjoying a rustic bruschetta is a fine way to cap a visit to a rustic village like Civita di Bagnareggio. Producer sighting, there's Simon. 
He hates to be on TV, but sometimes we don't want me eating alone. So there's Simon, hard at work, along with our cameraman, as we bring home another show. Hey, that was a little bit of Tuscany, and I'm Tuscany bound, or I'm 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 Central Italy bound. Tuscany, Umbria, Lazio. We want to be there. We want to enjoy the local culture. Uh, I do want to remind you, the um, spritz is it's like it's like drinking lemonade or something. It's dangerous dangerous and it's good when you're with new Italian friends on the piazza. I want to take a moment to remind you Monday Night Travel is a team and we've got great people on our team. We've got Julianne, we've got Ben, we've got Gabe, we've just been joined by Lisa. We are just so thankful you join us every Monday and we've got a lot of travels coming your way. If you want to see any of these bits without me breaking in all the time, Obviously, they're parts of a TV show. And all of our TV shows, there must be 150 of them now, are available for free anytime without ads. You just go to ricksteves.com, go to the TV section, find the show you want to watch, click, and you got it. Also, I want to remind you, Julianne's going to be fielding, fielding your questions after we're done with this little strip of videos, and I'm going to answer your questions. So if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A. And remember, we've got links to the places we're featuring in the chat widget. Next up, we're going to Romania. And in our TV show tonight, again, it's airing all over the country. It's called, what's it called? Europe Awaits. It's one of the best names we've ever had of a show. Europe Awaits, because it does. A warm and hearty welcome awaits us all when we get our shots and when Europe gets its shots. But uh, we're going to go, in the TV show, we're going to the most traditional part of Romania called Mara Marsh up in the north. It's just so it's like walking into a, an open air folk museum. Uh, but on this bit, I'm going to show you the other side of the coin, the capital city. That's where we're going to go now. And it used to be my least favorite city in Europe. Back in communism times, oh, it was just dreary. But right now, like so many towns, especially in the eastern part of Europe, it's, it's, it's energized. It's got freedom. It's got, um, it, it sort of appreciates its freedom after, after suffering through a terrible dictator. And we're going to see what this autocratic megalomaniac did. And if ever you have a wannabe autocrat megalomania that wants to take over your country, remember, his ego is so big, he might want to build a palace like we're going to see right here in Romania. There are different dimensions of Europe I want to see after COVID. And part of that is a place with no tourist crowds. If you want a place with a rich culture, wonderful people, and no tourist crowds, think about Romania. That's where we're going now. Romania's capital, Bucharest, with about two million people, is a sprawling tangle of buildings. It's muscular and gritty, hard to like at first glance, but with a thoughtful look, it reveals its charms. Bucharest has a raw and bracing urban energy. First-time visitors are struck by its eclectic mix of architecture. Just wandering the streets with your neck craned up is entertaining. The foundation of this architectural jumble dates from the late 19th century. That's just after Romania became a unified country for the first time. In the 1860s, without a royal family to call their own, the Romanians went shopping for a king who could connect them with the European mainstream. They found one in Germany, where a prince looking for a throne agreed to become King Carol I of Romania. King Carol embraced his new homeland while bringing Western reforms and securing true independence for Romania. Under King Carol, Bucharest blossomed. He imported French architects to give Bucharest a romantic allure. Today, Victory Avenue is a showcase of the city's Belle Epoque when Bucharest was nicknamed the Little Paris of the East. Well, the Little Paris of the East is, <laughs> that's a bit much, I gotta say. I like to be polite, but Bucharest, Paris, don't say them in the same sentence. On the other hand, it is the, like the New York City of Romania, that's for certain. And like any city these days, whether on the tourist path or off the tourist path, they've got a, a charming, energetic, creative, uh, sort of energized old town center, trendy pedestrian zone filled with dynamic eateries. I just love it. And I look for those whenever I'm working in our guidebooks. And we've got one that we're going to show you right here. 
in downtown Bucharest. The avenue rumbles toward the recently rejuvenated Old Town. Under more stately architecture, you'll find inviting pedestrian lanes. This is the traffic-free heart of town. Locals enjoy a fun and relaxing scene, and there's almost no tourists in sight. And the nightlife scene is on the rise. Formerly abandoned shopping galleries are now sweet with hookah smoke. Food trucks fill a vacant lot with late night sipping and socializing. If you're looking for fun after dark, this part of Bucharest can feel like one big sprawling cocktail party. Thriving as it is today, Bucharest's old town was lucky to survive the communist period. Most of the historic center was wiped out by the dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, so he could build a grandiose new town perfect for a megalomaniac. Ceausescu took power in 1965, and through his 24-year dictatorship, his ego ballooned. He became addicted to massive projects without budgets. After a visit to North Korea, Ceausescu returned inspired <clears throat> to transform his city. You heard it right. After a trip to North Korea, this guy returned home inspired to radically overhaul his city. Can you imagine an autocrat with, with a strange attraction to a North Korean dictator with a, with a passion for building things really huge and how this guy Ceausescu worked so hard and so effectively to con his people into thinking he could make Romania up there with the big powerful countries. He messed up his country big time. It was one of the great tragedies of, 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 our, of our generation really, or the last generation, is what Ceausescu did to the people of Romania and only now are they recovering. He ripped out most of Bucharest's historical core to create this, his enormous civic center. Its wide boulevards and stone-faced apartment blocks all have a distinctive Pyongyang aesthetic. The culmination of his master plan was an immense palace with more than a thousand rooms, fit for a dictator gone wild. Ceausescu literally starved his people to build his dream. Over six years, from 1983 to 89, thousands of laborers worked on it 24-7. When it finally opened to the public in 1994, that was five years after Ceausescu died, the Romanian people were both wonderstruck and repulsed. Today, guided tours lead gawking visitors around these vast and empty spaces. You feel small exploring its grand halls, huge staircases, and mega ballrooms. Ceausescu demanded the ideal balcony from which to deliver speeches while looking out over his new town and a boulevard grand enough to match his ego. This palace and similarly extravagant projects all around the downtrodden country created a powerful anti-Ceausescu sentiment that ultimately led to his downfall. In late 1989, with winds of change sweeping the Eastern Bloc, armed revolution spread across Romania. An angry populace filled the square here in front of the Communist Party mm. headquarters. They arrested their dictator and shot him on Christmas Day. This monument honors more than a thousand Romanians who died in the struggle to overthrow the tyrant and free their country. You know, I am so thankful I had the opportunity to travel there back in those dark times during the last decade of communism in Eastern Europe when Ceausescu was ruling Romania. And uh, I wrote about it in my journal. This journal is from 1978. I've had, during COVID, I've had just a beautiful time. I've got, I've got about eight of these journals. They're 200 pages each filled with text like this. And they're just vivid with, with memories that I had. And this was done before I had any interest in being a travel writer. I was a piano teacher, but I just was so fortunate to be able to travel in the summers because my students wouldn't practice. I said, I'm not gonna struggle with that. I'll see you in September. But I had my dear staff transcribe my journals, 2,000 pages now of typewritten uh, memories and so on. And I can search it. And I've forgotten these things back, what's that, 40, more than 40 years ago. But I was in this city 
I just want to read you uh, just an, uh, bear with me. This is just an example of what it would be like to live back then. In Romania, I found that people were hungry to befriend an American, but also afraid to befriend a Westerner. I felt like a forbidden social fruit. People couldn't travel to the West, but they could connect with the West through any tourist who was visiting. Our train got into the capital city of Bucharest at around midnight. A man I had talked with on the train saw Ruth, my girlfriend at the time, and I needed a hotel room. He took us around to a few hotels looking for a cheap room. We found nothing, and he invited us home to his place for the night. It was nearly one o'clock. We accepted, went across this strange town with him on a tram. I could feel the existence of this strict police state in the icy stairs that were fixed on me for the duration of the tram ride. It's funny, I noticed that back home, the anti-establishment liberal might shun our flag, the stars and stripes, but here the dissident with the tight leather jacket will sport the US flag or a US emblem on his coat as a signal of his unhappiness. After a ride that seemed longer than it was, we got off the tram and strange things started happening. We obviously were heading somewhere for the night with our backpacks on, and it was illegal for a Romanian to take in guests like us. Suddenly, a strange man began following us, and my friend and I instinctively stopped talking and act like we didn't know each other. The informer pressed us, questioning and being generally nosy. All of a sudden, my friend, for his own safety, vanished into a hedge, and we were left walking with the creep. We realized what had just happened, and it made us angry to see how people and neighbors had been changed into spies, informers, and enemies. What a terrible life under the dictator Ceausescu. I felt sorry for our friend, but I can never tell him because I'll never see him again. We took a taxi to the center, booked into a pretty expensive but very nice hotel, and slept like royals. That's just a little vivid moment from so many years ago, and I'm just so thankful to have had these kind of opportunities and to have personally seen Romania before and to be able to celebrate it today when they've got the freedom and the capitalism just going crazy and a newfound affluence. You know, all over Eastern Europe, it's like the difference between an old black and white TV and a vivid color TV now that, that, that good times are kicking in. Uh, and I got to say, if you're going to go to Poland or Bulgaria, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, or Romania, you're going to find what I think are the most changed countries in all of Europe, well worth visiting. And boy, when you think about the impact of a terrible dictator like that Ceausescu guy, you can imagine what it had, the, the impact it had on the traditions and the folk culture, but those traditions are so resilient and they're alive today. And I wanna kind of top things off right now with a montage of pageantry of the colors of folk life in Europe. Post COVID, when I go back to Europe, I'm gonna celebrate the traditional music. I'm gonna maximize it. I'm gonna know where it's happening and I'm gonna make sure to see it and enjoy it and celebrate it. As we look at this, imagine how much fun it's gonna be to go back to Europe after this COVID pandemic is over, after all of us get our shots, after Europe gets its vaccinations, and we can once again travel freely. So, today, Ceausescu feels like ancient history, and Romania is proud to be part of the European Union. Joining local families on a Saturday morning in the park, you feel optimistic. While Romania's challenges are significant, it's clear the country is moving in the right direction. Oh, I just love that. We were filming just there a few years ago in this park. The park like that was what I was walking through back when everybody was shady and afraid of each other. You know, the joy and the, uh, and the, the freedom and capitalism, capitalism and the newfound affluence of these former communist countries. It's like going from black and white TV to, to vivid color. I mean, uh, but, but remember, we always tend to be focused on the Cold War, but most people who live there today, they have no living memory of, of communism. It ended back in 1990. That was over 30 years ago. Poland, Bulgaria, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, they are about, I would say they're the most changed countries in Europe in the last generation. And for us to have memories from the old times, if you're old as me, and then to go back now, we got to remember this is a whole new age. And uh, dictators like Ceausescu, they're long gone, 
And regardless of how they messed up their cultures and their societies, these societies are resilient and today they thrive. I want to go now to a montage of pageantry that just celebrates the colors of Europe. And a lot of these next clips are going to be from former communist countries. And post-COVID, what I want to do is to maximize all of that festive color. Here's a montage of how Europe celebrates its heritage, and we can celebrate it with our European friends when we travel there when this pandemic is over. Festivals help maintain a culture's identity. Pageantry stokes local, regional, or national pride. And while annual festivals are the big events, this celebration of culture can be just as rich on a smaller scale. Traveling through Europe any day of the year, you can experience a festive spirit powered by music that simply makes daily life more celebratory. Beloved musical traditions have long helped embattled cultures to assert their identity, to sing and dance their way through centuries of challenges, like the Roma people here in the Czech Republic and throughout Europe. People everywhere grab their folk instruments, pull on their national costumes, and gather together to celebrate their culture. Here in Bulgaria, dance troops in colorful dress whoop it up Slavic style. And people celebrate what makes them unique as a nation. In this small Bulgarian town, in a land that uses a different alphabet than most of Europe, the entire population is out on the street for the annual celebration of their Cyrillic script. Imagine being in Bulgaria on the day they celebrate their Cyrillic script. Oh, who'd have thunk? You know, music and parades and, and, and this sort of, um, you know, traditional sort of um, pageantry, it really is good for the traveler's soul. And when we travel, if it's just hit and miss, you're going to do a lot of missing. You need to be on the ball, so you're on the curb, enjoying the parade, so you're in the pub, enjoying the music. You can do it, but you've got to take the initiative if you don't have a guide to figure it out for you, so you're not going to miss all of these flashing highlights. Patriotic hearts beat stronger with the sounds of each nation's unique music, such as klapa music in Croatia. or rousing folk songs in Romania. In Austria, cradle of so much classical music, waltzing is the national dance, and hearts beat in 3-4 time. In the Czech Republic, what could be more festive than listening to lively folk music while enjoying some of the best beer in the world with local friends? It's a great way to celebrate a good day of travel wherever you are. In university towns throughout Spain, Roving bands of musicians like medieval troubadours are a festival just waiting to happen. These bands are generally students available for hire. Here in Salamanca, a folk group serenades a woman preparing for her wedding. It's so much fun when you bump into a bar with music. Step right up, be part of the party. As an American, you are welcome in this circle. You know, music just brings out the smiles. It brings out the, the awareness that the world is filled with joy and love and beautiful people. You know, uh, this next bit is about pageantry that revolves around uh, royalty. And today there's a lot of countries that still have kings and queens, but they're all reined in by constitutions. They're constitutional monarchs. And you know, without those constitutional monarchs, you wouldn't have a lot of the pageantry that we tourists line up to see. Think about how fun it is for countries like England and Scandinavia and Belgium to have a king or a queen and lots of parades. Colorful traditions are often rooted in a desire to stoke patriotism. Many European countries, like Norway, are democracies, but still have constitutional monarchs. And they celebrate their royal heritage with a stirring changing of the guard ceremony. 
like this one at London's Buckingham Palace. These martial spectacles, like here in Sweden, are holdovers from a time when this coordinated show of force helped dispel any thoughts of attack or revolution against the crown. And you'll see cute little ceremonies by cute little countries, like here in Monaco. In Greece, fierce, if gaily clad soldiers remind their citizens of their hard-fought independence with rituals at the national capital. Even though Europe may be unified as one, each country has its own national pride and national holiday. The most famous of these celebrates the violent end of a monarchy and the advent of modern democracy in France. France's national holiday is July 14th, Bastille Day. And that means a big party as all of France indulges in a patriotic bash. In Paris, that means lots of flags and lots of parties. Everyone's welcome to join in. Like towns and villages all over the country, each neighborhood here hosts parties until late into the night. The local fire department's putting on this party, so I guess it doesn't matter if the fire marshal drops by. Each year, crowds pack the bridges and line the river as a grand fireworks display shares the sky with the Eiffel Tower. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty wild if you've been locked down like we have for the last year and a half. <laughs> but we are coming through this pandemic. And I know it's ridiculous to look at crowds like that, but I don't go to Europe to eat my dinner in a bubble so I don't get anybody else's germs. I mean, uh, social distancing and Rick's style travel have nothing to do with each other. I go to Europe to have my cheeks kissed in Paris right here. I go to Europe to crowd into those piazzas and lick my gelato with multi-generational generational hordes of people in the streets as they close down the traffic and enjoy their evening passeggiata to crowd into the pubs and enjoy the local drink not my favorite drink from back home but the local drink whatever that may be mm. like a spritz in northeast italy for sure and we're going to do that we are ready to get back into europe we're earning our freedom if we get our shots it's simple it's simple chemistry it's simple biology we get our shots the virus has nothing to eat and it goes away. I don't think that's oversimplifying it. And we've got certain people in our country and people in other countries too that they're worried about, oh, I'll feel bad for a day after I get my shot or they've got some political hang up about the shots, you know? Please, let's get together. Let's embrace the science. Let's whoop this thing. We've had vaccines all our lives. This is just one more vaccine. We can do it and then we can travel again. Canada and Europe, they've botched their initial rollouts. They're getting it together now. We're a leader in this. We're going to be helping people throughout Latin America and the developing world. It's an exciting time. It's a hopeful time. And we can travel again. So I'm just so thankful to be able to be looking ahead and be thinking of the day when we can travel again. We're going to earn our freedom to travel to gather together and live life like we've always lived life coming up 4th of July. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna be home for the first 4th of July that's been celebrated. Last year didn't celebrate. This year we're celebrating. I can hardly wait. I'm gonna be in the curb. Actually, I'm gonna be in a car. I get to be the grand marshal in my little town just cause it's the first time in 30 years I've actually been home to take that role. Uh, next Monday, we're gonna celebrate Bastille Day. One month early, June 14th before July 14th, Steve Smith our in-house Francophile, my favorite co uh, French expert, the man who's done so much to patiently teach me an appreciation of French culture. Steve's gonna be with us as we have a special edition, isn't every Monday is a special edition of Monday Night Travel. Uh, and we're gonna be featuring 
France without Paris. Imagine that, the countryside of France with Steve Smith. I hope you can join us there. And um, let's go back to Julianne. I think we've got some questions, Julianne. We have a lot of great questions. It was special hearing you read from your journal, Rick. It was like story time with Rick Smith. I, you know, <laughs> I had, this, is a, this is a half a page out of 2,000 pages of those kind wow. of experiences, Julianne, that mm -hmm. I was so blessed to be able to have. And for some weird reason, I wrote it all down. I, I don't know why. <laughs> and I don't even remember that stuff. I, I, I remembered the general thing, but to go back and read that, and now I can search it because we've got it all in one big Word doc and it's well, pretty cool. So well, stay tuned for more of that. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> um, first off, before you get to the questions, um, can we have a word from our sponsor? Well, you know, I'm very excited right now about our tour program. Uh, you know, we've got 100 people on our staff, you, me, about 98 others, and uh, we've been pretty much hunkered down this last year. And uh, we've got 100 guides in Europe who are freelancers with no work to do. It's heartbreaking. And we've got all of our travelers that have just got their hearts set on enjoying Europe, uh, in particular, the Rick Steves style way. And uh, now we've decided we can, we can reasonably expect with the trajectory that we're on with the common sense of america and europe to get our vaccinations that we will have a stable and reliable world to travel in between the rich zones of the united states and europe we still got a lot of work to do in the poor half of the world but there'll be plenty of travel and it'll be reliable travel between europe and the united states come 2022 we're very very conservative we've got small groups we're not doing anything as far as i know in 2021 2022 looks good. We opened the floodgates seven days ago. 20,000 people, more than 20,000 people have signed up on our tours. And we are just thrilled to be able to put people's travel dreams back together again. And uh, there's still several thousand seats open. If you're curious about that, go to ricksteves.com, go into the tour section. We know it's a little bit uh, uncertain times. And we have a very flexible and generous policy on deposits. You need to put a deposit down to guarantee a seat, but it's totally 100%, no questions asked, refundable until the end of this year. So, you know, December 31st, you can say, no, we're just not comfortable. Just send us an email and you get your deposit right back. But if you want to assure some travel in 2022 on a Rick Steves tour, there's still time and you can go to our website and learn more about that. Okay, great. So our first question tonight, tonight you kind of talked about your backpacker roots. Is mm -hmm. there a time period where you transitioned from being a backpacker into, I don't know what you would call a normal traveler, I guess, suitcase traveler? Was there a certain period that really shifted or? Well, in so many ways, I'm still a backpacker. Yeah. I still travel with my backpack. Mm -hmm. I still sit on the floor at the airport. I still <laughs> steal lunch from my breakfast uh, buffet. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't admit. Um, but um, uh, I, I like being on a shoestring, but I also like using my time smartly. And for me to have enough money to travel the way I like to, any way I want to travel, basically, the thing I do is I, I spend money to save time. I'll take a taxi for an hour from one hotel to another instead of going to the train station and changing and all that kind of thing. Um, I'll hire private guides. I'll, I'll fly a little more and so on. So, uh, and then I've got the responsibility of my work. If I've got a, a TV shoot going on, I, I just need to get my beauty rest and stay healthy and get my job done. So I just, I'm thankful for my work. I take that very seriously. And when I'm traveling in Europe, which is most of the time I'm in Europe, I'm really focused on that. So researching the guidebooks, making the TV shows, doing the tours. So I suppose I got away from my backpacker glory days of travel when I became um, a workaholic with mm -hmm. this company that I've built and I, I really love it. So, but I would enjoy the opportunity to travel like my kids do. My kids yeah. just, when they travel, you can imagine, they just, it's, it's just footloose and fancy free. And I, I get this a similar joy out of just providing the information so other people can do that smartly. I guess that's kind of a connection. Mm -hmm. It makes me so happy when I see people my kids age using the guidebooks, being smart, and at the same time being free and a little bit crazy it's a cool thing. It's a very cool thing. Okay. And tonight we saw a lot of local dancers and musicians. How is that organized for the show? Is it a local guide that sets that up for you or how does that work? Well, for the shows, mm -hmm. a lot of the dancing is just, Hey, there's a parade. Let's get it. You know, yeah. we didn't ask permission for that Cyrillic language festival in Bulgaria. It just was the day all over Bulgaria. Every town's got the festival. And in that case, it's a, a time when all of the school kids, they, you know, in our country, in our culture, we have certain things. I don't know. I'm, Halloween, we dress up and go trick-or-treating. Well, on Cyrillic Alphabet Day, they all dress up and 
parade down the streets and the marching bands going on. So we were just there on the curb, didn't ask any questions for that. But if something, and you know, we got into the fireman's ball in Paris, that was just sweet talking our way in with the camera mm -hmm. um, on that bridge with everybody uh, with the fireworks over the Eiffel Tower. I, I could see everybody in the corner of the film of the shot holding up their iPhones and getting their shots. And I'm just glad my cameraman was really tall and he could get above that mask with their <laughs> iPhones. That's a big problem these days is people, every you get the perfect shot and somebody's got their iPhone up on your <laughs> TV camera, you know. Uh, but we always ask permission if we're doing a, you know, if we see buskers on the street, we'll ask permission. Um, and we always credit them at the end of the show. Um, and then if we're in a formal concert situation, then that's a big deal. You don't see us doing a lot of symphony uh, mm -hmm. uh, photography, because, videography, because there is serious concerns about that. And that's mm -hmm. much more complicated than, than what we're usually interested in doing. Mm -hmm. well, that's good to know, very interesting. Yep. And then our last question to, for tonight is from Cody. And I thought it was a fun question. He said, Rick, when are you gonna make a cookbook? <laughs> uh. <laughs> There's the when Ricardo am I going to make a cookbook? So. <laughs> oh, let me just, that is so funny because uh, I've got a friend who writes this book, Ooh. Italy for the Gourmet Traveler, Fred Plutkin. And we're going to come out in a partnership, I believe, with this book. I shouldn't even announce it, but it's got great recipes in it. And uh, that might be part of that. But um, I would only make a cookbook for if, if society wanted a, a more humane alternative to prison sentences for people and they just had to eat all my food um, because I, I don't know how to cook. I, I would never make a good food. That's a funny question. <laughs> but I'm glad that people enjoy that. I am really enjoying my dinner of insalata caprese, the capri salad from the island of Capri, and my bruschetta and my spritz. And uh, spritz is an interesting thing. You travel and you you realize what's everybody drinking? I didn't know what a spritz was, but I was curious. I found out, and now it's part of my arsenal of ways to connect with people when I'm traveling. I hope that you all enjoy your Monday night escapism with me when we get together and we celebrate our love of travel. Next week, remember, is France without Paris with Steve Smith. Don't miss that. The week after that, we're going to celebrate Europe's artisans. And after that, we're going to be joined by our wonderful Basque guide, Francisco Glaria. And we're going to go to Basque country. So we've got lots of great Monday night travel coming up. I want to remind you right now that our two-hour special on public television is airing all over the country. If you get a chance to watch it, do so. Your stations on public television will be running it. They're running it tonight, and they'll probably run it again. So look for Rick Steves, Europe Awaits. Thank you all so much for traveling with us. And I want to remind you, every Monday night, we gather together because we are travel partners. Happy travels, and thanks a lot. This, we were talking about communist states. This is a Czechoslovakian trumpet. It has French horn valves instead of um, piston valves, like a, a regular trumpet that we would be used to. And this. And that's the way we close out Monday night travels. No, through COVID, I had a tradition in my town when there was a nice sunset over the Olympics, stepped out on the deck, played taps on my beautiful trumpet, even though I'm not a beautiful trumpet player. And everybody would go, yay, yay. It was a moment where we're all together in our community.